Democracy. 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 They're how we became the greatest nation on earth. What's the problem with a democracy? And I believe that after this episode, you will have more suspicions regarding the existing democracy in Western countries. Because I have revised my views on it, not on the democracy in general. For sure, I didn't become a fan of dictatorship. Oof, sigh of relief. And I still believe that democracy is the best form of state organization for the comfort of citizens and for the fruitful economic development, at least in the current global capitalist system. I want to assure you people and assure the country, the economy is now on. And here I fully agree with Winston Churchill, who said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried already. But what do we basically know about democracy? The word democracy comes from the Greek language and literally means power of the people. That is a political system based on the method of collective decision making, with equal influence of participants on the outcome of the process. The main features of democracy are the following. Appointment of leaders takes place through fair and competitive elections. People are the only legitimate source of power. And society is self-governing for the common good and satisfaction of common interests. There are also a number of values associated with democracy, like legality, political and social equality, freedom, right to self-determination, human rights, and some others. But the most basic idea that needs to be emphasized is the democracy is self-government for the common good and the satisfaction of common interest. In a democracy, the government has no right to hide what it's doing from the public. And here is the fair question, is it really so? Especially in those countries that claim they have already achieved the level of democracy they are talking about. Do these countries respect the basic principles? Are decisions being made for the common good? And here you need to understand that the common good is not the only for the inhabitants of any particular country, but for all mankind, because otherwise it just doesn't work. Otherwise, it would be hypocrisy, right? As if, for example, at home you decide to keep everything in clean and sort garbage, but at the same time in your office you throw garbage everywhere. What a stupid son of a No, it doesn't work like that. You will behave everywhere following your understanding of what is right and what is not. So let's get back to democracy and pay attention to developed countries. As I said at the beginning, I'm a little disappointed with these countries. It just seemed to me that in modern Western world, there is not yet the level of democracy they claim about. The government system is too much centralized and the influence of the human factor is still too great. As a result, many decisions are made contrary to common sense. Decisions have been made based on some insults, whims, anger, and of course, please no worries, we don't forget about the main reason. How can we talk about politics and forget about money? You know, somewhere between 700 billion and a trillion, 300 million billion dollars. And all these list of things became especially noticeable for me personally and by the way, for many of my friends with the start of the military operation in Ukraine, although it would seem why. Now the popular opinion is that Russia is the epicenter of evil and all other countries are somehow struggling with this evil. Russia is, is going to be uh, joining the category of evil empires. Just like the motor and the Fellowship of the Ring. <laughs> <laughs> For your understanding, I'm not trying to justify anyone or say that Russia is a true democracy. No, of course I have never had any illusions about Russia in all other Soviet Union countries, including Ukraine, by the way. I understand very well that all these countries are still far from the democratic state structure. Really? But it's not Russia that now is important for us. As I already said, I have always been a very active supporter of democracy. I like the way of life in Western part of the world, in US, Canada, Western Europe. I sincerely thought all these countries were very close to democracy already. In the normal sense of this word, when decisions are made, not by some individual officials based on their personal preferences, but by the majority of people and for the majority of people, when every single decision is made on the basis that all people living on this planet should be happy. Jeez, what a baby. <laughs> and therefore, I relied on the experience of Western officials. I thought that right now is the time for developed countries to show everyone what the real democracy is. Time to use all the accumulated wisdom and solve this Russian-Ukrainian problem. Try to solve it for the benefit of all the people around that situation. But what I've seen and what especially is happening now just disappointed me. No. For example, let's take a look on the crisis between China and Taiwan. By the way, it's partly quite similar to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict in its beginning a few years ago. If you delve into the history, it becomes clear that China and Taiwan are essentially one country, divided into two parts after Mao Zedong captured power in China in 1949. 
and General Chiang Kai-shek, along with those who supported him, fled to the island of Taiwan. For a long time, these countries developed independently, and finally now many people have accustomed to the fact that these are two different countries. Everyone is so used to that fact that now people are sure that this is how it should be. But has anyone asked an opinion of those people living in these countries? Maybe they don't mind uniting or even want it? Perhaps. Of course, surveys are not always 100% accurate. Everything depends on the age of respondents and their number, objective and correct construction of the questions and many other conditions. But polling results in Taiwan show that slightly more people support independence and more active collaboration with the United States than China integration. Probably this is due to the predominance of the young population in Taiwan. However, the difference is not great. On average, it's somewhere around 60 or 40. And this is a bit strange that no one takes into account the opinion of people from this country. 40% of Taiwanese do support this integration. It's almost a half. China people all supposed to look at the peaceful uniting. And most of these opinions are ignored by Western officials. But how about democracy? Why don't you listen to people's opinion? And the most interesting question. What are you all doing there? All American and European officials, what are you all doing in China and in other countries? This is 10,000 kilometers from your home. Why is the president of the United States, the world's richest country, spending so much of his life focused on Europe's poorest country, Ukraine? What's going on? That's a good question. Why are you so much concerned over what is happening in the rest of the world? The United States is a global power. And we actually have to be able to exercise our uh, interests and our values globally. I'm sorry, what? Miss Rice, I have to disappoint you. Your interests are limited by the borders of the United States. Take care of what's happening inside your country. Don't you have enough problems of your own? Inflation, gas problems, recession. Many things to care about, solve them. Or you think China and Taiwan are not able to sort out all things without you there? Do you really think you understand better this issue, Chinese issue, than Chinese and Chinese? <laughs> Because just to remind you, if you forgot, technically these guys are one nation. What? But well, since you have decided to worry about this case, maybe it makes sense to help. I mean, help in normal way. To make sure that the situation is resolving without any possible suffer of any single person from each side. Hmm? Maybe it would be logical to invite all representatives of Taiwan in China on the round table and discuss this. Together with them, come up with a solution in which no one suffers. Not so easy. If they would like uniting, let them do it. If one side doesn't want to, then do your best to lead us to an agreement which satisfies all parties the most. That looks the right approach, especially if you call yourself democracy. Which is obviously strange. But instead of this, Western officials for some reason provoke and even escalate the conflict. American ones come to Taiwan for what? To annoy China? Why are they doing this? Yes, really? I do, I do. Of course they have a right to do that, but at the same time, they know how this issue is important for China. It's a very sensitive one, and they know this well. Why are they doing this? Why are they sending their ships and aircraft carriers there? Why all these provocations? To start the fight? Come on, do it, do it, do it, come on! I'm just wondering, adult people are making such actions. Do they think about consequences? My button is bigger than yours and my button works. Remember that? People said, Trump is crazy. Seriously, this can really cause a fight. And I'm already not sure what the real goal of Western officials is, because all their actions are not aimed on the settle of the situation, but in an opposite way. But maybe this is the real goal, to make this fight happen. Maybe, maybe not, maybe yourself. And if it will happen, it will be not good for anyone at all, neither people of Taiwan nor people of China. And this can take place, because something similar had already happened with Russia and Ukraine. In February 2014, the U.S. helped overthrow the government of Ukraine. That's, that's really a crucial moment in this story. It started a long time ago. During the existence of the USSR and after its collapse, there were many discussions between the officials of Russia and Western countries about not extending NATO's border to the east. Well, I think it wasn't a secret to anyone that this is an important point for Russian politicians, especially after the Caribbean crisis in 1962, when the USSR decided to deploy missiles in Cuba right after the US had already done the same in Turkey, which in the end almost led to a global conflict. And despite numerous statements from the Russian side not to do this, and despite this terrible past experience that almost led to a catastrophe, Western countries still continued to expand NATO's border to the east, intending to accept Ukraine into it as well. What for? Was it so necessary? And not judge from today, look at this point from the past, when it was a peaceful time, especially considering that there was a kind of agreement. NATO would not expand eastward. This is, this is beyond any dispute. People say, well, they never signed a treaty. But a deal is a deal. The United States gives its word unless we're shysters. And you look out at where NATO is and where they want to go, it's everywhere. It's everywhere on Russia's borders. The expansion of NATO is the expansion of the American sphere of influence. 
plain and simple. So there has been a tremendous expansion of America's sphere of influence since the mid-1990s, right plunk on Russia's borders. It's, it's taboo in America to talk about this issue of who has a sphere of influence, who's entitled to it. Just to be clear, in no way I want to justify anyone in the current situation between Russia and Ukraine, because any military conflict is a disaster for people. I just would like to ask Western politicians, is this exactly what you wanted to get? Because no one of you really tried to resolve the conflict. Russian officials have warned many times that if something like this happens, there will be a military collision. Мы очевидно, процесс натовского расширения не имеет никакого отношения к модернизации самого альянса или к обеспечению безопасности в Европе. Наоборот, это серьёзно провоцирующий фактор Again, I'm not justifying, I'm just asking, what were all these provocations for? And all these questions anyhow brought me to the idea, maybe the conflict is the real goal. Shame on... Shame on you. Instead of trying to understand the historical reasons around Crimea and Donetsk, and on the basis of this somehow try to help settling the growing challenge, everything was done the other way around. And again, I think that military actions are unacceptable. But I'm just wondering how quickly American officials would react if Russia or any other country deploy missiles somewhere in Cuba or Venezuela. What a stupid question that is. What a stupid question. But I watch you a lot, you ask a lot of stupid questions. Sorry for the short break, just would like to tell you that if you are, like us, a big fan of Chinese electric cars and would like to get one of them, because China now is number one in electric vehicles production in terms of price and quality. Because no matter how funny it could sound, but even German manufacturers cannot reach that level. So, if you would like to get one of those beautiful cars, follow the link in the description below and Cars of Future team will bring you any car you wish in any place you live. Good luck. I'm not hinting at anything. Just current actions make me think. American officials themselves behave far not the way they would like others to behave. Always accuse you of the very things they're doing themselves. And even now there's a feeling that everything is being done only to further enhance all the conflict. I don't see any actions to resolve the situation. The only help we see is the supply of a huge amount of weapons to Ukraine. We've committed nearly 700 tanks and thousands of armored vehicles, 1,000 artillery systems, more than 2 million rounds of artillery ammunition, more than 50 advanced launch rocket systems, anti-ship and air defense systems. But is it a help? Because this is a war. People will continue suffering. And I'm constantly asking myself, how about democracy? How about ordinary people? And again, I begin to think maybe this is not about democracy at all. Maybe this is somehow connected with the profits of American corporations. Perhaps. Or maybe that's because a huge amount of money has been sent to Ukraine without any audit. That might be a question for Zelensky. Where's all the money going? Again, the United States will continue to strongly support Ukraine. And we will do so for as long as it takes. In the coming months, we expect to provide around $10 billion in additional economic support for Ukraine. The other half a billion dollars we're going to be we're announcing with you today and tomorrow. You're looking at perhaps $200 billion to Zelensky and his wife in 12 months. $200 billion. Because you can do with this money everything you want, especially using the possibilities of cryptocurrency market. It's easy to hide some money and handle it back to where it came from or whatever it needs to be sent. <laughs> Maybe this is the case, because in the US it's quite complicated to carry out some corruption schemes within the country. It's possible, of course, as everywhere, but a bit more difficult than in some other places. <laughs> American system is quite decentralized and the court is more or less independent. So as a result, there is a kind of existing control over taxpayers' money. And this is, of course, a great advantage of the United States. But apparently, if money has been moved outside the US, then it's much more simple to split it. And maybe that's the point. People are getting very rich. You can't have an audit because if you want an audit of where your money is going into the most corrupt country in Europe, you're a tool of Putin. Or maybe this great headline to think about it. Could this be the real goal? Because that's exactly what is happening. And this also doesn't look like what is called democratic values. Or maybe this is just about ordinary theft of property. You may take a look at what is happening now with Russian businessmen. Is there any logic and sanctions against specific people? Because some cases are simply ridiculous. Let's take, for example, Arkady Volosh. Volosh is the founder and CEO of Yandex. This is an IT giant on the past USSR countries, like Google. He wasn't a friend of any high-ranking officials when he founded the company. He didn't work in the mining sector. He established his business in 1997 and was not seen in closed bonds with government agencies. So why this guy, who I'm sure is the most likely even a supporter of Western European lifestyle, 
why he fell under these sanctions. Why should he have all these troubles, like what happened with his apartment in Netherlands? And by the way, this case is absolutely beyond my understanding. I will just remind you that his house was taken over by squatters under the slogan No War and No Capitalism. Well, the first requirement is a bit strange for the person who has nothing to do with the state service in Russia. But well, that happened, and it would seem that a fair court in Netherlands should have thrusted them out. Get him out of here! Get out! But no, the judge held there was no any significant reason for that. And when Mr. Volosh's lawyer began to say that the house was planned to be used, for the personal purposes, the judge said that since Mr. Volosh is under the sanctions, he probably will not be able to use this house. And that's why his decision is not going to be changed. What? what? Seriously, what? Where is the democracy and justice? Because I don't remember that someone took property from Steve Jobs or Bill Gates after many US military operations in Iraq, Libya, Yugoslavia, Panama, or at least the world community criticized this action somehow and put the revenge on all US businessmen. Nothing like that happened. I'm thinking maybe American politicians just simply need some kind of enemy. An image of enemy. In order to build military bases everywhere, provoke conflicts, deprive property, and as they call it, help other countries. In other words, to be able to somehow transfer money outside the United States. And well, then with this money, you can do whatever you want. Corruption is a very tempting thing, you know. Maybe this is the real reason. Otherwise, how to justify so enormous US military budget? Because without an external enemy, all this will not be working. Okay, okay, I'm not insisting that all of this is true, at least I want to believe at this. But current actions make me think about it, and not only me. There are people who try to understand the roots of the conflict in order to end the bloodshed as soon as possible. Now, after what happened, of course, in 1954, in a symbolic action, because there was a Soviet Union at the time, not, uh, not separate nations, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, the uh, chairman of, of uh, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the chairman of the Soviet Union, transferred Crimea from Russia to Ukraine. It, it didn't mean much. It was a celebration, a 300th anniversary of a treaty that uh, Khrushchev celebrated by this administrative transfer. It became consequential after the end of the Soviet Union and the independence of Russia and Ukraine. Or this guy who has already become a victim of numerous gossips. I, I very much disagree with that. And who honestly was absolutely correct in his proposal. Or take a look at this example. Slovakia's new prime minister Robert Fico said literally the following. I will support zero military aid to Ukraine. An immediate halt to military operation is the best solution we have for Ukraine. The EU should change from an arms supplier to a peacemaker. I don't know how do you find this statement, but for me it sounds absolutely and totally correct, because now the most important thing is to stop the fighting. It's a little bit late to play heroism and try to return lands by Ukrainian government. It will simply lead to more deaths. Is it really worth to swap out land on life? I thought in the modern world it's obvious to everyone. The country is the people, not land. Not land and people, but only people. Human life is the most important thing ever. Wrong. I thought that a time when people were so openly and cynically used for some crazy and useless purposes has already gone. I say useless because I don't fully understand the purpose of this territory return. This is a serious question, especially in connection with the fact that the most important thing in each country is the life improvement for every single person. So what is the point of the land return? To earn more money and increase an average salary in the country? I don't think these are connected things. Average salary or wealth index doesn't require land. Such small countries like Netherlands, Japan or South Korea have a pretty large GDP, although they don't have large territories or a significant amount of minerals, which in some cases could be a reason of an economic growth. In some cases, because it depends on how you manage the money from the sale of minerals. So in any case, everything will run into the investment climate within the country. And we know some examples where it was not possible to create a rich state despite the huge oil reserves, like Venezuela, or for instance Russia. Yes, it's not the poor country, but Russia is the huge country, the largest in territory, two times bigger than the United States, 46 times bigger, than Japan. Russia is the country with the largest explored mineral reserves. It's difficult to calculate, but according to approximate estimates, there are more than 70 trillion dollars worth of minerals. And what? Are Russians the wealthiest people in the world? And I mean not 25 oligarchs, but in average. As far as I'm aware, no. Because again, everything runs on the corruption and the investment climate. Only this facilitates to the prosperity of the country's economy. In capitalism. That's important note. But anyway, that's what really affects, but not the territory. That's why I cannot understand these slogans about land return from Ukrainian government, from Ukrainian officials, especially considering that for this return, 
they will have to pay and spend more and more human lives. The most valuable thing ever. People are more valuable than money. Any Ukrainian, American or Chinese is worth more than all the money in the world. Any mother of a dead soldier will tell you this. And if his wife or his child. But here is a slight paradox. Ukrainian officials blame Russian ones but behave exactly the same way. They talk about the land return and force people to fight without a choice. So I really understand many young Ukrainian men who are trying to bribe border guards and leave the country, despite it's not possible during the war, because they don't want to fight and probably die. They understand that any war ends in a peace. And most importantly, if we consider what was said above, it turns out that perhaps people in Ukraine are forced to fight because this conflict is profitable for someone, for some people somewhere. So why should they fight for this? And that's a reasonable question. That's why Elon Musk is most likely correct in his statement. Well, I'm trying to do good things, yeah. All steps to settle down the conflict and prevent the war should have been done before. Like if you were Ukrainian president and you knew or suspected that you have a dangerous neighbor or a neighbor who is jealous to the historical or cultural values of his country. What would you do to care about the people living together with you in your country? You most likely would try to establish good relations or at least as peaceful as possible to avoid any conflicts or misunderstanding with this neighbor. You would not ban Russian language, right? Well, it's weird to do this, considering that in Ukraine more than 30% of the population speak Russian. Why not to have several languages, like in many countries of Western Europe? You would probably not forcefully crush demonstrations in regions where people have a slightly different position, right? You most likely sit down at the table with your neighbor and try to agree on everything without bloodshed. And finally, you would do your best for the economic development, of course. You would try to establish a visa for a regime with European countries and Russia, trying to invite foreign investors and at the same time trying to ensure the gas supply at a favorable price for the industry development. You likely would act this way if you want prosperity for your people. You would not provoke your jealous neighbor and do everything in an opposite way, correct? Hey, don't talk to me that way. Don't talk to... I'm the president of the United States. Don't ever talk to the president that way. But as I said, it's a bit late to talk about what should have been done. Now the best thing could be done is to stop the fight. And then officials could discuss these land issues forever. How much time they want. They may grind their tongues into powder. The main idea is that people will not die. And maybe the money that now is being sent to the war producing new weapons that have been directed to the restoration of an infrastructure. We've spent more in Ukraine, the US Congress has, then we spend on all of our roads and bridges in an entire year. Build hospitals, schools, airports, set up a business. Maybe this is the real help. But we don't see all these actions from politicians. Looks like Xi Jinping is the only one who's concerned about this. He announced a plan to settle that problem. And it's very pleasing. Firstly, because it needs to be finished as soon as possible and by any means possible. And secondly, because China now is a very powerful country in the economic and military sense. And I wouldn't want Chinese government to decide participating in this conflict somehow. So despite the fact that US officials accused China in lack of respect for democratic values, the Chinese government is showing maximum wisdom at the moment. They're not reacting to provocations in Taiwan and trying to settle the existing conflict, which, by the way, has been enhanced by countries that call themselves strongholds of democracy. And that's very strange to me that Zelensky is not doing the same. The president of Ukraine, he's supposed to be the first who should want to end this war because it's happening in his country. He should have told the Americans that instead of supplying weapons, let's focus on the negotiations and then let's restore Ukraine together. Isn't that the right goal? I know that, you know that, even Ross knows that. But no, he puts on his green t-shirt. By the way, does he have another one? Why he's always in this green one? Anyway, he goes to US Congress and talks about protection of democratic values. Seriously? Democracy in Ukraine? When you actually look at what Zelensky's democracy yeah. is, you see uh, no freedom of the press. He has shut down any media that he does not control, his government does not control. He has gotten political opposition uh, arrested, made sure that that's happened. As you mentioned, he shut down the biggest Ukraine church uh, in the country. And, and I found this quote today. He has actually threatened to punish, quote, any Christian caught worshiping in unapproved ways. As far as I know, now it's impossible to say in Ukraine a phrase like, guys, maybe forget about this crime Let's end the war and build a successful economy. Wow, who says that could get a serious problem? I don't know, maybe it's some kind of special democracy, but for me it looks more like a dictatorship. No more falafel for you! And I understand that this is also beneficial for Zelensky personally. Well, of course. Without all this happened, no one would even know about him. There would be just a passing president who is not remembered for anything. And now, he's a hero. Everyone comes to him. He's been called everywhere. He appears on screens at award shows. He's on the cover of newspapers and magazines. He's now a real superstar. And for sure, he will go on the second term of presidency and most likely win it. I even think that no one would dare to stand as a candidate against him. I'm not a big democracy expert here, but I don't think what's happening has anything to do with the real democracy. I'm not even talking about the conflict that has broken out between Palestine and Israel. 
Politicians from different countries use poor Palestinians simply as a mean of trade in their political games, because the conflict itself could have been resolved a long time ago. And again, instead of allocating huge amounts of money for the war and supporting different sides of the conflict, the entire country could already be rebuilt. But for some reasons, this is not being done, so it's beneficial for someone. The money for the war is allocated together with noble speeches. It's not just a weapon, it's salvation. And they say the same things to both sides of the conflict. Politicians from countries that donate weapons to Palestinians say they're helping Palestinians because they're fighting for independence. Others who help Israel say that Israel must defend itself. But did anyone say something like, listen, maybe let's stop the war right now and start helping the people who are suffering from all this? No, it's not interesting. Well, of course, because by these actions, all the wars could be finished everywhere. How then politicians will make money out of this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, there have always been wars, conflicts, and they have always been caused by benefits for some specific people. Sometimes for revenge. It was in the past, and all these reasons are pretty clear for everyone now, in the present time. But the current situation suggests that only a little has changed since then. This situation has shown that developed countries are not so white and fluffy as they would like to appear. They talk a lot about democracy, but do nothing to follow the true meaning of this word. This is the most deceptive, vicious world it is vicious, it's full of lies, deceit, and deception. These are just words. In all these countries, the system still allows some selfish goals and interests to prevail. And hiding behind good intentions, terrible things actually happen. We don't want to insult anyone or hurt anyone's feelings with this release. This is just a critical thinking. We're asking questions, reasonable questions. And I think that more people will ask such questions, the sooner current conflicts will end and maybe other potentially possible collisions will hopefully not begin.